The political decisions people make will affect many lives. Many people see politics as the government and the laws being made. While that is true, it's way more complicated than that. I don't know what type of procedure is this. Some of you may be aspiring to positions of leadership in the political arena. And I accepted full responsibility. But the question is, why do you want to lead? It has everything to do with you. Every law that is made will impact many. Sometimes the decisions do affect people negatively. Therefore, it's very important to note that every vote that you cast will either break or make people. Politics with GA brings you the latest political news as well as insight and analyst as we discuss the most important issues that matter. Hello and welcome to Politics with GA. Political parties have kicked off campaigns nationwide for all elective positions in line with the timetable of the Independent National Electoral Commission for the 2019 elections. The Independent National Electoral Commission published the forms and particulars of candidates submitted by political parties for the 2019 joint elections at its offices across the Federation in October 2018. And President Buhari will be facing scores of contestants I in the presidency. Of all 91 parties in the country, 89 had expressed their intention to field candidates at next year's polls. However, only 79 parties will field candidates for the 2019 elections, and this is a record in Nigerian history, according to INEC chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakub. I spoke with one of the candidates that will be challenging President Mohamed Buhari for the presidency. His name is Professor Kingsley Mogalu of the Young Progressive Party. He spoke about his candidacy and plans for Nigeria. Thanks for joining us on Plus TV Africa, Professor Kingsley Mogalu. Thank you, Benga. And congratulations on your emergence as the YPP presidential candidate. Thank you. What's your take on the Nigerian political scene as we inch towards the 2019 general elections? Well, I think we can see very clearly that Nigeria is at a historical moment. Um, I think that's very obvious because what has not happened before is very likely to happen in 2019. We can already see the signs in, the, in terms of the rise of alternative candidates in a manner that we have never had before in, in politics in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, I think clearly the people of Nigeria are tired of the status quo. And I think many of them are yearning for something new. Our country is big, bold, and beautiful, but we've been let down. And when you say something new is about to happen in 2019, you don't have a crystal ball in front of you, but from your calculations, what do you think uh, would happen? I think what's likely to happen is the surprising um, uh, victory that the YPP, the Young Progressives Party, is going to achieve in the presidential mm -hmm. elections um, in, in February, uh, beating the APC and the PDP. That's going to be a shock, and it's going to be what, like what happened in, uh, in America in 2016, when we all thought we were walking to the coronation of Hillary Clinton and we woke up in the morning and Donald, Donald Trump Donald was Trump. the president. That's what's going to happen in Nigeria because a lot of people think mistakenly that it's a two-horse race between the APC and the PDP, but they're not reading the mood of the people at the grassroots very well. They're not even reading the mood of most of the middle class very well. Uh, most of the people who make these assumptions are the political elite, you know. Mm. Um, the work that remains to be done by candidates like myself is to turn the mood of the Nigerian people into votes at the polling booth. Now let's talk about your emergence as the YPP presidential candidate. Before then, there yes. was this uh, group called the Presidential Aspirants Coming Together Pact that yes. became Unpact, an alliance that had people like uh, Showa Rare, Feladriel Toye, and others. Uh, some said, uh, a lot of people have questioned your decision to leave the pact because you didn't emerge as the consensus candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say to Feladriel Toye if he did exactly the same thing? you did by leaving the pact? Well, the reason some people say those things is because they don't know what I know. Please set the record straight. Yes, let me be very clear. Yeah. I walked away from the pact because it was not transparent. 
and because I had the right to walk away from it constitutionally as a Nigerian, and that was part of the agreement, that you don't have to be bound by this. That but was some would Article 13. Your, uh, judgment in that. No, it's not a matter of judgment. If you find out mm. that an arrangement is, is, is not transparent and that some funny things are happening, you have the right mm. to walk away from it, don't you? Are you Absolutely. suggesting I should subject myself to some shenanigans just so that it will be that I, you know, it's not right. It's not fair on me when a certain result comes about by processes that are questionable. And even when you left, the yeah. other candidates, I mean, they're standalone candidates. There's no alliance as it is. That's uh, because yeah. I left. And that shows you who should have been the outcome of pact. When I left, it had no, it had no credibility anymore. Now... International acclaimed writer, uh, Nigerian, um, one of Nigeria's greatest known figures, uh, literary figures, uh, Chino Achebe, once said that the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a problem of leadership. Do we have a leadership problem or followership problem or a mixture of both? What's I think we have both. We, but first of all, fundamentally, we have a mm. problem of leadership because we have lots of politicians in Nigeria, but no leaders. People who are seeking to come to political power in Nigeria, many of them do not understand what real leadership is because our society has produced a paradigm that is not one that can lead to transformation. It's leadership as just power, us versus them, you know, loyalty versus competence, you know, uh, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, power versus uh, service and responsibility. So, so that's the conundrum we have in Nigeria. Politicians want power on the basis of divisive tendencies like ethnicity, religion, those types of things, but not on the basis of a unifying vision. They want to be elected so that they can have authority, but they're not focusing on their responsibility to the people who elected them. They, they, they want loyalty in terms of sycophancy, that's what they call loyalty, but they're not interested in competence. So for all these reasons, Nigeria has not achieved its potential. But why Our, haven't the people been able to put their politicians that's where, in check? That's where mm. the people problem, the followership problem comes in, because our people have been beaten down by those who are supposed to have been their leaders into a state of submission. They've been beaten down that way because the state controls the levers of the economy, uh, they've been beaten down that way because they've been made poor, poorer and poorer over the years, and now Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. And the politicians themselves are now weaponizing this poverty um, and trying to make these. So it's a it's a vicious you know it's a vicious um, cycle. Um, but I think the people themselves finally are beginning to realize that what's happening is not what should be happening. And this happened because of the election of 2015, where they thought they were replacing a government that had failed with one that would mm. succeed, and found out that this one they elected has failed even more than the one they... So, so they have now become disenchanted broadly with the two big parties, the APC and the PDP. And this has set the stage for what's going to happen in February. And now you've decided to run for the highest office in the land. What Absolutely. informed this decision? And do you have what it takes to fix these problems? Well, I decided to run because, of course, I was concerned with the failure of the recycled old politicians. And I was disappointed with the amount of, with the level of, of increasing poverty that you and I can see very clearly in Nigeria. And I'm asking myself, what's the future for our children? What's the future for our youth? What's the future for our young women? You know, what's, what's the future for, for, the, for the Almagiris in the north? What's the future for the victims of Boko Haram in the displaced, in the uh, camps, of the refugee camps of the displaced mm -hmm. persons? What's the future of the young man in Onisha who, who cannot find a job? These are the things that led me to enter uh, the race uh, for the presidency. Now, obviously, I am far more prepared for this than pretty much any other candidate because there are three things that a president of Nigeria will face on the morning of May 30, 2019, after he or she has been sworn in the day before. One, the challenge of nation building. Two, the challenge of managing Nigeria's economy. 
Three, the challenge of restoring Nigeria's standing in the world, uh, you know, and that requires mm -hmm. competence and knowledge of international relations and diplomacy. So I'm the only candidate who has experience and a track record across all three. But it takes a lot to get your message, however brilliant as it might seem sure. and sound. You have a fantastic blueprint, but politics in Nigeria and pretty much most places in the world, you need a huge uh, you need financial resources, and um, you're not on the Forbes list. You don't have godfathers. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> that will back you. What is your strategy? And you said they've weaponized poverty. Yes, and I, it's quite unfortunate. That's right. That even when you put black and white, we should not. Rather, we, let me tell you, we yes. should never despair about the possibilities for. Um, you know, real change because I am not on the Forbes list. If I was considering that, then I wouldn't even run at all. Mm. But I want you to see how far that I have already come. We are already changing. But, but looking at the no, reality no, of no, our that's, environment. We are creating a new reality. The conversation is changing. This is what people don't understand. Human beings mm. create reality. What's your strategy? My running, my running for yes. president has already created a new reality in this country mm. because all the polls will show you that I am the third force. After the APC and the PDP, my candidacy is number three. I am the leading contender among the alternative forces. That's mm. a new reality, which has been created in nine months of struggle, Absolutely. communicating with the people of Nigeria, mm. engaging with them. So therefore, our strategy is to keep pushing the message down to the grassroots. I'm operating at three levels. The YPP's presidential campaign is operating at three levels. There's one level that I call the 10,000 uh, feet helicopter bombing, mm -hmm. then there's the ground game, and then there's the underground game. So we are operating at those three levels. You may be seeing me on television, and that's the 10,000 feet helicopter bombing, and mm -hmm. think that that's the only that's thing all. we are doing, yeah. but it's not. We have structures across all the 36 states, and those down to every local government area today, both the YPP structure and my own personal structure, the Kingsley Memorial Support Organization, KIMSO, and then we have the Kingsley Memorial Volunteer Force. Then we have the Youth for Kingsley Memorial. Then we have the Women for Kingsley, W4K, Y4K, KMVF, KIMSO. This, and then the YPP structure in all the states of the Federation. They may not be famous because they're not the PDP or the APC, and they're not as old as Methuselah, but they're there and they're working. They're talking to people. Fantastic. And people are responding. So, so what, this is, what happens is that you will now wake up in February and see a result that will shock you because you, you were not expecting it. Now, let's, you, if you emerge president of Nigeria, you'll yes. be inheriting quite a uh, Nigeria that really doesn't work. If you look at all the statistics and indices of, of human development. We are, we are at the, the bottom. bottom. Yes. Yeah. And um, it's not... A very good time. And that's, that's, that's precisely the reason why the voters and the citizens of Nigeria should have a very sober mm. reflection before they go and vote. Do you want to re-elect people who have brought you to the bottom indices of human development everywhere, whether it's human mm. capital, whether it's health, whether it's uh, jobs? It's, it's a choice. 2019 is yeah. actually a choice between the past and the future. What will your priorities be if you emerge president of Nigeria? My priorities would be securing this country. Uh, my priority would be building the human capital of this country because that is, mm. is the foundation for every other type of economic development. You my priority would yes. be providing leadership. My priority would be making sure that women have a place. These are the kinds of things that will occupy me. Now, let's look at a few of the things you mentioned. Yes. Um, let's start with security. Do yes. you think... And by you, the way, yeah. I've set out my vision very clearly in this book. Build, innovate, and grow. My vision for our country. And I'm the only presidential candidate who's written a book with a very clear vision for Nigeria. This book... So is, this book can count as your policy document? It's, it's yes. my manifesto. Your manifesto. Yeah, it's not just some slapdash put together, hurriedly mm -hmm. put together document. This is a book. I sat down, thought it through, and there are 25 visions here. There is no other person in Nigeria who's prepared to be president among all the candidates Great. as much as I am. Now, back to security. You mentioned security yes, exactly. as a parish. Yeah. And Let's we're, look we're at looking security. at what's going exactly. on now. It's, um, and what, what would I do as what, president? We're in a very bad state security-wise. 
do you have what it takes to go against the former general and the person of incumbent president uh, Mohammed Buhari? Would you do a better job by uh, far. with security? By and far. What gives you this confidence? Why well, do you say so? Well, I say so because it's very obvious from President Buhari's performance that the hood does not make the monk. We thought that his being a former general would lead to better security in Nigeria. Sadly, we have seen that that is not the case. Competence is not a matter of whether you are in the military or not. Competence is, is, it comes from inside, and it, it requires a certain type of training. Now, the reason why I would secure Nigeria far better than President Buhari is this. I have a much better understanding of what national security means than his government obviously does. They think that national security is just Boko Haram. But mm. it's not. Boko Haram is just one aspect of national security. There are others. You have the uh, Fulani headsmen, so-called Fulani headsmen. Mm. You have the issue of our borders. You have the issue of, uh, of uh, the police. Even the teeming so, number of unemployed people Even is the teeming number risk. of unemployed yeah. people and the rising poverty in this country is a national security issue. So national security is a multidimensional matter, and you have to have a certain amount of intellect to be able to understand this. And if you don't understand the problem, you really can't solve it. Do you see the point? Mm. So number one is that I understand what the challenge is, because I have the intellectual and practical experience as a former United Nations official, as a former deputy governor of the Central Bank, uh, and as a, as a professor in one of the world's leading universities. I have built up years of experience of understanding what are the threats to human security. So, armed with this understanding, the first thing I would do is that I would bring into the national security leadership apparatus the people who have the professionalism mm to be able to up operate at this level. So we would bring professional leadership to the leadership of national security. Right now, the leadership of Nigeria's national security apparatus is very parochial. It's based clearly on parochial considerations. So, no, not competence. So, not competence, no, I don't think so. So you can see that what this government is doing is they're protecting their regime. They're not protecting the people mm. of Nigeria. That's, I am here to protect the people of Nigeria as president. Number two is that I would have the political will that President Buhari has not shown. For example, with the herdsmen, we haven't seen them being brought to account after all the killings of people across the country. That, that should tell you something. Not even one. I am not aware. Prosecuted, yeah. I am not aware of any successful prosecution, any real prosecution, you know? Um, so that's, that's a problem. Thirdly, I will reform Nigeria's borders. Nigeria's borders need to be made secure. You've just seen the rise of a new security threat in Sokoto mm. State. All kinds of bandits, and we now read that they came in from Mali and things like that. Why is it that Nigeria's borders are so porous, and people can come in from Chad, from Cameroon, from Mali, from wherever, and be wreaking havoc, especially in the northern part of our country? I'm very concerned about what's happening in the north, because if we don't fix the problems in northern Nigeria, we will not be able to fix this country. So the North is very, very important. And we need to secure our borders uh, with, with the Northern states so that our citizens can really have secure lives. So we will bring in border reform. We will demarcate all our borders. And we will secure those borders with personnel to make sure that anybody, nobody, can walk into Nigeria undetected and unrecorded. You see what I'm saying? And then finally, on security, finally, my government is going to establish a 21st century police force. We are going to recruit, train, and equip 1.5 million new policemen and women. Do this, we have the resources to do that? Yes, we, we have those resources. Mm. They just need better economic management to find them. And this government is not competent enough to find those resources. And talking about economic management, yeah. and like you said, the you have, you were deputy uh, governor, governor of the Central, Central Bank. Bank of Nigeria. Yes, absolutely. A huge percentage of Nigeria's income is spent on debt servicing, payment <laughs> of civil servants, and recurrent expenditure. Everything have that is unproductive. Quite, quite little left, about 20% for development of absolutely. a country as huge as Nigeria. as Nigeria. What strategies do you have to get us out of this quagmire? What is 
Mogalonomics yes. and uh, what's your economic blueprint? Well, Mogalonomics, as uh, some people have, have said, first of all, we are going to put a moratorium on foreign borrowing when I become president. There is no need. How do we survive? Ah, <laughs> let me tell you how we survive. Are you suggesting we should just continue a to borrow? A moratorium? I mean, we, we are not gauging the future of young people like you when we acquire mm. more and more debt from China and all these people. Now who go pay? Mm. <laughs> Who's going to pay? So, so he, how do we function? Yeah, he that goes a borrowing, goes a soaring. So let me tell you what we're going to do. That's quite bold. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. I mean, first of all, there are two things that my government mm. will do to release or bring in much more revenue. The first, of course, is that we're going to have to abolish the petroleum subsidy. It's a huge waste of Nigeria's resources. About 1.3 or 1.4 trillion naira every year going the, into this. But the no, ordinary let, Nigerian let will argue that... No, let me finish. Let me, yes. let me finish my, my trend of thought. Um, petroleum subsidy, first of all, favors the rich far more than it favors the poor. It is the rich that have the big SUVs that need to be subsidized. The petrol cost needs to come down. People who are riding a bicycle in Kaurana Mother or, or riding some small scooter, they're not the ones that are gaining from but petrol. But others who argue that yes. this is about the only thing we enjoy from this government. No. We're paying one of the cheapest rates for petrol no. in the world. And a lot of things are tied to the cost of can petrol. I, can I, the, yes, it, can I, can I, yes, can I speak? Yeah, yeah. Let me explain to you that that kind of thinking is wrong. What an economy needs is production. It is not for consumption to be subsidized. It's wrong economics. And that's why Nigeria is poor. What we need is a productive economy, not an economy in which petrol is being subsidized. Why should we be exporting raw petroleum and importing refined petroleum products in the first place? And then, so, as if that's not, let me, mm. allow me to answer the question. And as if that is not bad enough, you are subsidizing the importation of that refined petroleum product so that you can pretend to your citizens that it is cheap for them to have petrol. What you should have done in the first place is that you should have refineries that are working in this country and refining petrol for our consumption. So we are going to solve the problem at the root. Not, you know, importing refined petroleum products and then subsidizing them. No, we're going to make sure that the refineries work and that means that they're going to have to be privately owned. We're going to make sure that we deregulate the market, downstream market for petroleum in Nigeria. If you allow the private sector, without subsidies, right, to handle the whole question of petroleum, whether it's the importation or whether it's the refining and sale, Competition will bring down the price of petrol. That's the answer to your question. But it will be a sudden shock and the blowback. It's not going inflation. To be, no, uh, cost no. of transportation will go up. Salaries don't go up yes. often in Nigeria. Okay. So now, how what's do your you suggestion? Plan to handle that. Good. Of course, we know it's what is good for us on paper. So but it's not about what is good for us on paper. It's not to do no, that. No, Benga, this kind of thinking is why Nigeria has remained in the rot. It has remained for 20 years now. It is what is good for us. It's not good for you. How is it no, good no, for you? I'm saying, I mean, taking off the petroleum production. Like of your, course. Your, your exactly. ideas, I do it's, agree it's with you. Just like the GSM. You have the will it's just like to... the GSM. What happened with the GSM? Was it not expensive at first? Within a short time, the price mm. of everything crashed. Today, it's very cheap to have GSM. Cell phones are so cheap. Mm. Let me tell you, political will and courage is a necessary part of leadership. If you keep pandering, wanting to be popular, then you don't know the first thing about leadership because leadership is not always a popularity contest. So let's get that very you straight. You will always be this, Mr. Nice Guy. Yes, mm. if you always <laughs> want to be Mr. Nice Guy, then you're not a leader. You have to take decisions that the people will come to see eventually that you had their interest in mind. That's how Singapore became a powerful economic country. That's how Malaysia developed. That's how China has risen. So we can't keep messing around in Nigeria with mediocrity. Politicians who just want to be quote unquote popular mm. and don't want to do the right thing for the people of Nigeria. Now, the next place of getting a lot of money out, you need to stop paying petroleum subsidies so that we can pay Nigerians a human minimum wage. You can't be paying people 18,000 naira a month. That's a poverty wage. 
the, I stand with labor that the minimum wage should not be less than 30,000 Naira. But where are you going to find the money? You're going to have to find the money by doing these things I'm talking about. Absolutely. And also, you're going to find the money. I propose that we should abolish the security vote in this country. It's, it's a black hole of corruption. And that's why the state governors will tell you they cannot pay 30,000 Naira. Uh, a month, but do you know how much they have in their security votes? It's almost a cut lunch for them to Good. Uh, do anything. But you would need the parliament to do that. You can't of course. Uh, pass that no, no, of course. Uh, as an of executive course. order. Of course. Now, talking by about the way, that. By the way, yeah. before we come to that, I want to say that it's also very necessary to reform Nigeria's tax system. No government's revenues. Any government that is making progress in the world, every government in the advanced countries, their primary source of revenue is taxation. So we have to have a social contract with the people of Nigeria that if you pay your taxes, here's what the government is going to do for you at a minimum. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so you know for a, a, an assurance that you will get this level of service, public service delivery. So it's, it's one hand washes the other. Unfortunately, nobody can you know, mint money from heaven to finance um, public sector activities. Citizens have to. I, I'm not arguing for an increase in taxes. No, I'm arguing for an expansion of the tax base. We, our tax to GDP ratio is just 66%. And that's so low, it should be at least 20% or 25 or 30 So that means that there are a lot of people who are not paying tax, who could and should be paying taxes. And there are no penalties for that. That's why exactly. the, the tax Absolutely. So, so, is so, don't, so don't worry, don't wonder why Nigeria is where it is. It's because we have incompetent leadership. When we have competent mm. leadership, such as the King's Memorial the Presidency, you will begin to see a difference in the lives of ordinary Nigerians. I will be setting up a one trillion naira venture capital fund that will invest in new businesses of millions of unemployed people in, in, in other, all the parts of the country. Where will funding come from? For this 500, billion, 500 billion will come from this um, failed and useless uh, 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 social intervention fund, which is just a pipeline of, of waste and corruption. It's just a place to make APC cronies happy with contracts. There's nothing happening there, and even some officials... But they're, they're feeding... Uh, please, I mean, the, please, the, the, please. The money going to the poor. Please, 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 Benga, please, mm. save me and spare your fellow Nigerians. Don't buy into this kind of propaganda. You know, when you say that they're feeding. How many people are they feeding and with how much money? With 500 billion? The, 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 the vice president made a statement the other day and people challenged him that if this is what you claim you're spending on school feeding, then it's not true because it's far more than what you say you have allotted to it. Mm. So you don't listen to the propaganda, the false propaganda of this government. I'm interested in creating jobs for Nigerians. Don't let the government feed you. Let the government create an environment where you have a job, where you've gone to school and gotten the skills that will make you employed and useful to yourself. Don't be a charity case. This government is not thinking properly, economically. They want the whole of Nigeria to be a charity case. No production is going on. I am interested in economic production, not in Nigeria just holding a hand out. I'm interested in your having a skill. I'm interested in your going to school. I'm interested in your creating a job for yourself. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in coming to give you a handout. We will have a social security fund for the elderly. That's a different matter. Mm. But for people who are able-bodied and young, you need to flip the paradigm so that they go to school, so that they have skills. You teach and them how to fish. You teach them how yeah. to fish. You don't just keep giving them fish. Thanks for watching Politics with GA. I am Benga Aborowa. The political decisions people make will affect many lives. Many people see politics as the government and the laws being made. While that is true, it's way more complicated than that. I don't know what type of procedure is this. Some of you may be aspiring to positions of leadership in the political arena. And I accepted full responsibility. But the question is, why do you want to lead?
It has everything to do with you. Every law that is made will impact many. Sometimes the decisions do affect people negatively. Therefore, it's very important to note that every vote that you cast will either break or make people. Politics with GA brings you the latest political news as well as insight and analyst as we discuss the most important issues that matter.